Welcome to our podcast, friends. Thank you so much for listening. If you like our podcast and want to support us, please subscribe or follow us. And please don't forget to click the notification bell so you will be notified when new episodes release. Thank you, and God bless. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me and my friend, the friar, Father Stephen Sanchez, a discalced Carmelite priest. Good morning, Father. Wait, no. Good. It's the afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Oops. John. Hey, it's close. It's it's like twelve thirty. It's close. It's, it's yeah. close enough. And you didn't say good evening. That's okay. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Good evening. So tell me about that <laughs> podcast or that thing that you you saw about justification. You were mentioning something about that. Well, tell me a little bit. Oh about yeah yeah what... yeah yeah yeah. So I saw this. Um, it's a. I don't know. I say it's short. Seven minute interview with John MacArthur, um, who I'm going to go ahead and just guess he's some kind of evangelical Protestant Christian. Um, I know the okay. name. I have I haven't done a lot of research on him or anything like that, but I recognized his name. And the okay. title of it, of the video, was How Can We Know That We Are Really Saved? And like guarantee. I was like, yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll bite. <laughs> you know, I'll watch it. This, this will be fun. And um, it was really interesting because the vast majority of what he had to say I felt was not terribly different from Catholic theology, except, okay. except where I where I think if I could articulate the difference, we would say that the the gift of grace, right, that w- it, it's given to us freely from Jesus's sacrifice on the cross, right, that redemptive yes. grace, we can't lose the offering of that right it is freely right. given to us and right. it's always there for us yes right? and i think his theology would say that instead of it always being available to us it is instead that if we i'm assuming bap- if we're baptized christians right we accept we have accepted that that gift right through our baptism and now no matter what i do well i was i was going to say no matter what i do i can't lose it right so kind of the once saved always saved however the the interviewer some young guy he he kind of pushed back he's like well then how do i know right that i've really accepted it and that it's really, I'm really justified, right? I'm really saved. And he, and John MacArthur starts talking about, um, there are things that seemed very much like gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Like you, you would be humble, you would be, uh, loving, you'd be patient, right? Kind of your life, you would have this inner conversion. A manifestation of virtues? yeah, and those would persist through challenges, right? And he kind of cites some, he's been, you know, he's had some rough things happen in his life, right? But his faith endured. And that, again, is kind of that fruitfulness of accepting uh, God's God's grace, his, his be, being saved, right? These are manifestations because he is saved. Right. So I think those are the kind of the two things where it's like he thinks... Once you accept it, you can't lose it, but you uh, maybe it's the kind of thing where you had to have really, truly accepted it <laughs> for, for it to have really be a faith that lasts, where, which again, it like, that's kind of like the toil of, of Catholic theology. It's always there for me, but I have to persist, and I have to try, and I have to, it's not like I'm earning it, it's just I right. can't turn away from it kind of thing. All right. Well, I think one of the things we have to remember is within Protestant theology, um, there's a lot of schools, which means... Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of different ways of thinking. There's no 
because there because there is no authority, right? They, they yeah. don't have an yeah. authority. There is no unified theological expounding or philosophical expounding. And if this person is an evangelical, even less because they have less of a history of that, right? So it mm-hmm. depends uh, what school of justification he belongs to, right? So again, for us, when we as Catholics speak of justification, we're, we're talking about what we understand to be our salvation, our redemption, justification. These are all the words that are used interchangeably within our within our tradition. And yeah. basically, when we speak of redemption, justification, salvation, we're speaking about the effect of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that yeah. it is through his life, death, and resurrection that redemption is offered to humanity, right? Uh, re- reconciles us to the Father. Yeah. I, and, uh, real quick, go ahead. because I, I don't want to speak falsely against poor... Uh, I should, maybe I shouldn't even say poor to good old John MacArthur. I looked him up real quick <laughs> while we're talking. He's he's uh, American Baptist, so didn't okay. say north, south, east, or west or whatever. But he's he's Baptist. Okay. So, and again, he must be of a more moder moderate or liberal. If there is such a thing as a liberal Baptist, uh-huh. uh, a more moderate <laughs> Baptist, because Bap- Baptists come from Calvinist theology or understanding of justification, which goes back to predestination and irresistible grace. And I mean, there's lots of things there. Um, yeah. So let's first let's first look at the the Catholic st- understanding, and then we can explore a little bit how it's different from some of the mainline. Protestant ideas, right? Mm-hmm. And so for us, when we're talking about justification, salvation, redemption, we're, we're, what we're saying is that there's been some sort of conversion. There's a changeover yep. in a person from a state of injustice or sin to a state of justice, righteousness, or grace, right? So first, let's, we, let's go back to our scripture and, and get a scriptural foundation as to what it is that we're trying to discuss here, or the idea, the concept that we're trying to enunciate here. So the the verb that is used in the Old Testament for this question, this idea, is sadak. And sadak means to be just, that is to be, to have that moral quality of, of justice, of righteousness, right? But sadak also has a juridical sense, like everything. And had, there's there's a secular, a worldly sense that becomes uh, religious or spiritual. And in the juridical sense, it is to be found not guilty. Okay. But the understanding is, in Sadak, is that the person is declared innocent before a tribunal but that the, the the declaration of innocence is more of um, a person that is vindicated. Like, I'm accused, and then they find me innocent because I am innocent. That's what Sadak means, mm. right? Yeah, so not, like, not so much like we can't, we can't prove it, so we're letting you go. It's instead exactly. we have found the truth of it, which is— The truth of it is that you are not guilty of what you're accused yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what Sadak means, right? So that's where we get beginning to that beginning uh, theological, spiritual understanding of what justice, redemption, salvation is, right? So in the Old Testament, when there was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what they, they call the Septuagint, in the Greek translation, the word that is used for Sadak uh, or justice means there's a little variation in the meaning there. It means to give justice, which means then that it uh, it means that the innocent is declared acquitted and the guilty is condemned. Uh, so there is something there about um, to give justice is not about 
finding you innocent, but it means justice is the innocent is the innocent is acquitted and the guilty is condemned. That's what the Greek mm. meaning is, right? Kind of like the the saying "justice is served." Yes. So it's yes. not just that you're it's not just that you're innocent. If someone's guilty at the same time, like their punishment or they're punished or they get, you know, whatever's their due. Right. Right. Oh, Ber- Bertha joined us. I don't know if she'll be quiet, but she's laying down now. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, Bertha. She wants to, to put in her two cents on justice. Yeah. Okay. So now an import for us in the Judeo, well, I should say in the, the Christian understanding of the Old Testament, our, our way of under, interpreting uh, the Old Testament, uh, a key text, an important text, is found in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, verse 11, where Isaiah speaks, Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he will bear. So in this context, then the servant, he's talking about the servant, and we understand uh, it to be Jesus, the definitive. Jesus, yeah. Yeah, it is the servant, right? So that's who we understand that scripture to, to mean to, to prophesy, right? But if you look at the text, through his suffering, my servant shall justify many and their guilt he will bear. He also acts as the judge. So it is the judge who is declaring the innocence of the accused, but it is the judge who is taking upon himself the suffering of the accused to actually make the accused innocent. And this is a big difference between some Catholic, I mean, some Protestant theologians or theologies or ideas of justification versus Catholic. We as Catholics believe that a person is truly transformed, is truly made just or righteous, the remission of sin. In some Protestant theologies, uh, the person is still guilty and corrupt, but God chooses not to declare him corrupt. Yeah, like the king who forgives the debt kind of thing, right? Yes, yes, right. So the, there's, a, there's a difference there, and the difference is, and we talk about uh, imputed justice, and uh, imputed justice is like the judge says, you're guilty, but since I'm the judge... I'm not going to declare you guilty, but you're still guilty. But I'm not mm-hmm. pursuing just. I am not pursuing justice. I'm not pursuing justice in your case, right? And that's very important because in Catholic theology, there is a real transformation of the person. And as I spoke earlier about Calvin, for Calvin, the the sinner is still a sinner. You're still corrupt in your nature. You are corrupt to, to your very essence is corrupted. For us, there's a difference between corruption and fallen, right? That we're wounded by sin. For Calvin, it's corruption. And so I think Luther for a while hold, held on to that idea too, but I'm not sure if he changed his mind later or not. Yeah. But the idea is uh, the only reason that God can stand my presence is because I am covered in the blood of Jesus. I go like, uh, that's mm. not that's like he's not, tolerating you. Exactly. And that's not what we believe, right? So, so when are we made just if there's that transformation under Catholic uh, theology? There is. Is that a loaded question? <laughs> yes, it is a loaded question, John. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, okay? Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, okay we'll get to that in a minute. So, so this is important in distinguishing a Catholic understanding of justification from some other tradition who do not believe in the real transformation, the real remission of sin, right? And as I said, I mentioned earlier, that there is this the difference of what, what's, what's called imputation or to name something, right? Uh, to accuse something. So the fact is, for us, there is... The justice is a real justice. I am truly made made innocent. That's the transformation. That is the not just the conversion of my turning to God or turning to Jesus, but that that turning for us as Catholics, we'd say, makes us a real creature, a, a different creature through the grace of baptism, mm. and that's where it begins, right through baptism, right. But anyway, would this would this be Go the ahead. same 
um, potential, without going too far in the weeds or get, kind of getting off track, um, same thing, like when we go to confession, we are forgiven of our sins, whereas right. Protestants who don't have for, um, confession... Sacrament of confession, right. They... Like I guess their sins are forgiven, but for us, it's like I don't know how to say it. Like if it was in a ledger, like it'd be scratched out. Like it's not there anymore, right? Like there Correct. is no sin. It's not like the sins is like whatever. Now you, you might go do the same sin again, but at that moment when you're forgiven, the slate's wiped clean, right? You Correct. are a new, completely clean creature. Correct, and in some Protestant theologies, it is still there, but God chooses not to press charges. Mm. Okay, so that's a that's a big mm. difference, right? Yeah. Okay, so now, when we talking about justice and righteousness, and about you said earlier, <laughs> you asked earlier about when am I made just, right? That's okay. Yeah. So let's look a little bit at. Uh, when Jesus talks about this. So Jesus stressed the difference between the ju- the justice of the Pharisees and the justice that he calls us as his disciples to live. Uh, and this is, you find this, especially in Matthew's gospel chapters five through seven, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount discourse, which is, you know, a, a, a long section there, those, those chapters five, <laughs> six, and seven. Yeah. So, In Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says, tells his disciples, unless your justice exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Okay, now, okay, so here justice doesn't mean crossing the line from sinful to holy. It's 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 an implication of a way of life. There's an implication here of a, a, a right way of living, um, a holiness, a, a covenantal life. So there's not a, a precise moment when one crosses from guilty to innocent, from sinful to holy. It, it, there's there's something else that that is implied in this statement. So, okay, so that's why <laughs> that loaded question is like, uh, we're going yeah, because we have to go. We have to go back to the episode on sin that we talked about not too long ago. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that yeah, because that's interesting. Because when in that in that verse, it makes me think exactly of a way of life. Because the scribes and the and the the Pharisees, right, and the Sadducees, they weren't bad guys. They were they no. were living out the faith the way they understood it. Right? Correct. And so, what he's telling, unless you are, I I kind of read the word holy into that as well. Unless unless you're living a way that is holy or or trying to be more covenantial in how you're doing things than they are, then yada, 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 right? Yeah, and which was a a big challenge to the disciples of Jesus during his his earthly life because for them, the scribes and the Pharisees were the righteous. They were the holy people. I mean— The Pharisees were usually affluent, and they had plenty of leisure time to actually do all the things that needed to be done in terms of right living, right? And the scribes, they they, well, not only did they know how to read and write, but they knew the law backwards and forwards. So they were thought to be like, wow, that must be super holy. And when Jesus says that your justice has to surpass or exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, they're going like, what? What does that mean? And then he goes on later on in, in in Matthew. He goes on to give what what's known as the antitheses. You know where Jesus says, "You have heard it said, but I say to you, like about you, know, you have heard it said that thou shalt not murder, but I say unto you, you know, do yeah. not put a stumbling block on your or your brother. Do not all gang, do not grow angry with your brother. Do not call your brother uh, foolish or useless." Right. So his point there is, is that. The real justice, the real righteousness, the real covenantal life, the right relationship with God comes from the interior of the person. It comes from their inside, right? It's an understanding of the self, an understanding of the other as God's children. So then 
And then he goes on to address some of the foundational spiritual practices again, almsgiving. When you give alms, prayer, when you pray, and fasting, when you fast. And again, these are presented not merely uh, as actions to be accomplished, but he's trying to under he's trying to make his disciples understand that there it's a realization or a manifestation of the deeper self, of the spirit of the person. It doesn't matter if you give alms or don't give alms. What matters is, is it a manifestation? I mean, I should say you should give alms, but it doesn't matter <laughs> if you if you give, you know, from your surplus or if you give from your own poverty. What matters is, is do you understand the why of it? Do you understand yeah. the, that this is a realization of, who you are it the action is flowing from who you are as a person not necessarily from a uh, a task list that you're you're trying to yeah. accomplish yeah. or to to finish yeah and that seems to line up with kind of what John MacArthur was saying right that you'll know that you're really saved because these things will kind of like like you just said flow from you're being saved, right? Your right. goodness right. and all these kinds of yes. things will happen. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. And so then within the Christian understanding uh, of salvation, then redemption, justice, justification, we believe that we are saved, that we are made just in Jesus Christ because He is God's Word made flesh, He is the innocent and just victim who has died to sin for us so that we can have the option, we can have the freedom to respond to that invitation to live lives of holiness, right? He has redeemed us by his passion, death, and resurrection. He's taken upon himself the punishment for being unjust, Right? The injustice, then he takes upon himself and nails it on the cross. And that's what we would call like objective salvation or objective redemption. Now, the work of the individual, because then we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, the free will is that do I accept the invitation and make it mine? Right? Yeah. Uh, the, ca- the new encyclopedia, the new Catholic encyclopedia says that. Christ brought to fallen men forgiveness of sins and restored the life of grace, which anticipates the glory of heaven, which then is the completion of man's redemption. So our redemption is not complete until we are in glory, right? Until we're in heaven, right? So justification is the application to individual persons or subjective redemption of Christ's redemption. So accordingly then... If there is a justification, then th- th- by implication that there is a fall, there is a need for justification. You don't justify somebody that doesn't need justification. So then that also um, implies that there is a universal reign of sin, and that also implies that there is an, an inability on our part to be able to redeem ourselves or make ourselves righteous or just on our own. Now... Yeah, that's what, and that's kind of, again, going back to our sin episode, like, if y'all haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it, because um, that's the concupiscence, right, where just our tendency towards sin. Right, because of the fall. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, And so, for us, for the Catholic Church, it is through Christ's apostolic church uh, that Christ continues his redemptive mission through his church, through the apostles and the apostolic church, through the sacramental mystery of Christ, right? Through baptism, through the sacrament of penance, through the the, the healing sacraments, right? These are ways in which my sinfulness or my, going back to missing the mark, right? My sinfulness is truly erased, is truly done away with. It's not just, well, I'm covered in the blood of Jesus and so God the Father is not going to punish me. 
uh, he's going to put up with me because I'm covered in the blood of Jesus. I go like, no. And, and again, this is a whole theology of, of, of justification is I'm in the pro. I'm in the process of, I have been saved, I'm in the process of being saved, and I hope to be saved because it's conti- it is contingent upon my free will to continuously accept the grace that Christ is offering me, right? And this is where the free will is very important. I, I, I need to continuously accept this. And again, as you said, concupiscence plays a large part in this because... As I grow in my understanding of what it means to be son or daughter of God, I am going to understand that responsibility and I will continue to make better choices and deeper choices or deeper commitments to that truth. But as my understanding of that grows, so does my understanding of my commitment to that and so does my understanding of sin, right? So it's no longer a matter of mortal sin. It's a matter of like a lack of charity. Uh, I, sh- I should be more charitable because this is what God the Father expects from me because this is what has been manifested and exemplified for me in the life of Jesus Christ. And so, again, it's hard to talk about a, a, a hard line that you cross. There is redemption. There is remission of sin through, through baptism and the other sacraments of healing. But justification is a continual process of growing deeper into the life that Jesus Christ has won for me. Yeah, it makes me think a lot. Uh, I I had this conversation, you know, once upon a time with one of the guys I work with um, about if you can lose your salvation kind of thing. And it seems like if the answer is no, you can't, it seems to be, we talked a lot about nuance in our episode on sin. It seems to be a very unnuanced approach to it because whenever I think the average person and even a well-educated person is confronted with scenarios, certain scenarios, then it seems like now they start questioning it as well. So if I... Um, believe once saved, always saved, right? And I, I really, truly accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I don't know. On retreat when I was 18 or something like that, right? <clears throat> and then as I grow up, um, I get involved with the wrong people, and I start committing crimes. I, I still believe that Jesus is God, right? And he died for me, but I'm robbing gas stations, and I shot a guy, and... You know, I, whatever you, you just keep on going, right? Like I'm doing all these things. We talked about how you have to have that formed conscience, conscience and all that as well. Right. So everything is in the, into the depth of your understanding. Right. So when you, when you confront someone with all these scenarios, like you really truly believe God, Jesus, you know, died for you, but then you don't live like it you're telling me you're still saved, right? And a lot of people will start to kind of hem and haw over it because it doesn't give them the nuance to be able to to come back with, well, how formed is the purchase person's conscience, right? Did they understand what right. they're doing wrong? Did they have any other options, right? Like they, they don't right. know how to come back to that because that, that approach, I think that nuance is part of reality, in my opinion. Yes, you, and and you the, have to the church understand life church is says real. That, <laughs> the church says it as well. The again the in the new encyclopedia, the new Catholic encyclopedia, uh, it says that man's justification remains imperfect even after redemption and justification. Right in, in this world, yeah. yeah, man's justification remains imperfect and in a way precarious that means i can lose it i because of my free will i can choose to turn my back on god whenever i choose to it is always yeah. perfectible or capable of growth in grace in other words there's always room to grow there's always room for a greater sanctification a greater sanctity right 
So justification, remission of the sin, and becoming a child of God is only the beginning. You now have to live it out. Its fulfillment is not for this world, but it's in the next world when I will be fully and completely redeemed when the Lord comes in glory. And we have, you know, the, the final judgment, right? Well, we still have to make an episode on that, don't we? The four last things. So <laughs> yeah, uh, and so in, so do, this is does part that come of the back whole, to what? So 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 does that come back to either we are made justified or we are given justification? Is that where this still all hinges? For us, or, or am I still kind of missing it a little bit? No, no, no. For us, it is, it is, for, it is close. It, like it's, it's a little bit hard to grasp, you know. And again, and there, that's where the the difference in theology understanding is between Catholic theology and some forms of Protestantism. For us, we are truly made just. We are just. We are made just. For some Protestant theologies, you're not made just, you are named, you are, God calls you just even though you're not, which I don't understand how that works because then that means that God's a liar and God doesn't lie. So I don't understand that. I don't understand that theology. So anyway, <laughs> that's part of yeah. that theology, right? That understanding of of it. And so, I, and I think the way the way Calvin kind of sort of worked his way around it was that well, you're corrupt and you always will be corrupt, but the only reason that you're able to be in heaven is because you are covered in the blood of Jesus, and that's why you're there. Mm. Like, you know what this okay. kind of connects to in my brain, too, is the what? thought of sacramental theology, that the sacraments are efficacious, right? That they do yes. something. Yes. Right? They're not symbolic. So, So being... If you are named just and it's symbolic because you are still corrupt, you're still guilty, but I'm naming right. you like you're symbolically right. justified versus I am making Truly. you justified. You are right. redeemed. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And so as this theology develops, right, at first, you know, the early church fathers, they didn't have a whole lot to worry about. Because like, okay, I'm baptized. And they had the whole mm-hmm. understanding of, of the Old Testament and biblical justice and righteousness, right? So they had this whole understanding, and for them, justification, redemption, salvation hinged upon the sacrament of baptism and penance. And so, yeah. you know, okay, so the, the the assumption or the presumption is that you now have given your life to Christ and you're going to live your life in Christ. And so, okay, let's go on. So the grace that is given to us by the Holy Spirit not only redeems us and makes us just, makes us truly God's children, but also the grace of the Holy Spirit helps us to avoid sin. Again, free will plays into this, right? I need to cooperate with that, and I need to catechize myself, and I need to make better choices and all that. So it is through this habitual practice of virtue then, by growing in the life of Christ, then that means that concupiscence or the 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 natural tendency to fallenness becomes less and less of a deal in my life, right? Because mm-hmm. if I become habituated in virtue, then sin becomes less and less of an option. It's still very yeah. probable. It's still very possible. But it becomes less and less a probability the more I give myself to the life of the Spirit, right? To, yeah. to cooperate in that new life. And the first real challenge to the theology of justification or to the church as well was when a Pelagius, there was the Pelagian heresy that came about, which St. Augustine fought against. And Pelagius stated, uh-huh. he overstated the case, like most heresies are always overstated uh, things. So he said that because man is made, because God made man good, right? And so since we're a good thing, he says, well, we don't really need the grace of Christ to be good. And we don't need the the grace of Christ to do the right thing. And so immediately the church, you know, goes like, oh, wait a minute. By implication, what you're saying is that there is no original sin, there is no concupiscence. And if there is no original sin, no concupiscence, then why would Jesus redeem you? 
Yeah. What's the point? <laughs> yeah. What's the point? <laughs> so, again, St. Augustine fought against the, the, the Pelagian and semi-Pelagianism. And, and in St. Augustine's concept of justification, th- it sort of sets the, the whole stage for, in the West, in, in the Latin Fathers, kind of this whole idea of original sin, justification, all these things then start coming into, there's a developing theology about this. And this is in the West. In the East, not so much, because in the East, the Greek fathers, they didn't want to call the state of fallenness original sin, because they don't want to attribute sin if your free will is not involved in it. Like, I'm not choosing this. So this is the consequence of the fallen state, but they mm. they recognize that there's a fallenness in the human person, but they don't call it original sin. I think yeah. if I remember so they, correctly, they were just they're just trying to keep it separated sin from fallenness right, from from sin from fallenness, right? So okay, uh, if I remember correctly, my I had a Russian Orthodox priest as my Eastern spirituality teacher, and if I remember correctly, he they call it. Uh, um, a, speaking about the will, they call it a nomic, nomic, I think, nomic will. And what it means is concupiscence. It means that your will is wounded or, or, or fractured. And because your will is ru- wounded or fractured, there's a difficulty in making the right choice. But they don't attribute it to sinfulness. It's not because I'm sinful. It's because... I'm wounded. They're, they're focusing more on the wound than the idea of original sin, right? And their focus is responding to God's invitation to share in his divinity. So that's the East, right? But in the West, since we tend to be anal retentive, we needed to kind of make things more difficult than they have to be. So what <laughs> yeah, happens yeah, then... Hyper-defined stuff. Oh, yeah. We dissect everything to death. The... In the West, then after Augustine, then there's the rise of scholasticism, then, right? And the scholastics tend to be much more academic and they're much more um, conceptual, right? The abstract, they deal with the abstract. And so then the approach for the scholastics, uh, scholastics was, and so the question of justification was, okay, so... If your sin is remitted between the remission of sin and when you accept grace, how does that work between sin and grace? And sin and grace cannot, to them, it cannot be in the same person. They both, because they're opposites to each other, how can two opposites be in the same agent, right? So that's their problem, right? So how and why does the habitual state of sin make room for the state of grace? That was their question. So again, this will lead us back to the whole previous discussion that we had on the understanding of sin <laughs> and the question of fundamental option or choice of the person to be good or not. But the Catholic Church, after the Protestant Revolution, the Church reacted very strongly to the Protestant stance on justification, and the Church declares three main points, and these are the three main points that are still part of our theology, and that is Redemption, justification, sanctification implies the real, true remission of sins, right? Not just the lack of imputation. It's not just that God chooses not to press charges. So there's a real remission of sins, and not just their non-imputation for punishment. And, and even though there is, in the person, concupiscence after baptism— that the sin is the sin is still re, re, remitted. It is absolved through my through the grace of baptism, through the grace of sacraments, the healing sacraments. So, also then, justification means that there's an interior renewal, or I am I become a creature, a new creature. I become God's child for real through the infusion of grace, and that the gift of that filial relationship is the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, okay, we are truly transformed into God's children. And the third thing is free will. It supposes that the free acceptance of this grace and these gifts, it has to be in free cooperation of the human agent in faith, hope, and love, and repentance. And like, yes, I've messed up. Yes, I need to change. Yes, I need to be 
more virtuous, I need to be more patient, whatever, right? And those are the three main areas then of that. So when we talk about Protestant justification, it's really difficult because there's so many ways of approaching it. There's so many ways of approaching justification that it makes it very difficult. Um, there is one interesting thing, though, that I want to m- mention. Yeah. There is, um, so we talked a little bit about um, Augustine. There's another mm-hmm. approach, St. Irenaeus, and it's called Irenaean theodicy. Irenaeus believed that we were not made in a perfect state. So for him, original justice is not a perfect state. Like when we talk about paradise, right? Everything is wonderful and beautiful, and you know it's nothing but butterflies and rainbows, right? For Irenaeus was like, mm, no. Yes, there is original justice, but the human person was not made perfectly. They were in a state of justice, but you shouldn't understand justice as perfection. And so, for Irenaeus, it meant that we live in a the, we live in in a in a a way of having to choose to be to be made in the image and likeness of God to choose, right? And he says, for him, the importance goes back to free will. If I am in a perfect state and I see God perfectly, it would be impossible for me to sin because I would naturally, in original justice, if you understand it as perfection, I would naturally continuously choose God. But, but because we were made in, an, uh, in original justice, but imperfectly, to allow our free will to grow and so that we may become freely God's children and, and choose to freely be in his likeness, I have to be able to make moral choices. And that is where the freedom comes, and that is where the Irenaean question comes in, which I find very fascinating. I wish I could... Yeah find some more books on that, uh, find uh, an explanation or an exposition of that. Because I find that very fascinating in that I'd go like, wow, so I wonder if you could even apply that to the angels too. So the angels were in a state I of, was just thinking that. Were you? Like, okay, like, yeah, that's yeah, so, so funny. So then, okay, so then that means that the angels were, again, growing in their knowledge of God and they had to choose. And some choose chose to be faithful to God in the moral question, and others chose not to. And so we're like, that is a very fascinating uh, question because then it, it, it solves a lot, a lot of problems in, into the imperfection of the mm. world, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that it's it, that it's uh, that there is no fallenness. There is fallenness, but I think our understanding of original justice and, and the Garden of Eden. And that God made us perfectly. I think that's what's what the question is. The question is, God made us, but God made us free agents, and to make us free agents and allow us to mature and to grow, He made the world in such a way that we had to have situations in which there was a moral question that I had to resolve. I'm like, wow, that is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's like making us perfectly imperfect, right? So, yes. so that way, so we, that I can come to perfection. To puzzle yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really man. That's interesting. Okay, well, let's write that down for something that we'll forget that we said. <laughs> write that down. Like we should explore that. I think that's something that's. Um, I just got a book, um, called the. I think it's called the Fathers Know Best, and I think it's by Jimmy Aiken, um, and it's just all about the Church Fathers. So I'll. <laughs> I I just got it. I haven't had a chance to to open it or start it, but um, maybe I'm sure Irenaeus is in there. So. We'll see if it says anything about it. That'd be a fun episode. Okay. Um, I wonder. I wonder too, like where you were ending. How like after the the Protestant rebellion, <laughs> how mm. um, how the church kind of came back with, you know, okay, okay, you guys are saying all this stuff. So X Y Z, we're gonna say something in response to. Which is right. what the church did almost all the time. It's every time they say something, it's in response to some kind of heresy, right? Right, correct. But I wonder how many of the different Protestant 
theologies. It was like someone was just looking for a way to literally protest the Catholic teachings, like the t- everything that had been understood. So it's like, because Calvinism um, is very um, predetermined, like free will, I think, is a big problem in Calvinist yeah. theology, right? So it's so they're like, okay, 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 so we're going to take out free will. <laughs> you know, so it's like, we're just going to try and think of something so we can, like, take a stance opposing the Catholic Church, which right. I think is a really... Like, sorry, guys, I think that's a really bad way to do things, because then you have to try to reverse engineer a bunch of stuff yes. instead of accepting what was given by the apostles. Yeah, and I think, I think probably most evangelicals and most Pentecostal lines of Protestantism, <clears throat> they're much more open to the work of the Holy Spirit and much more open to these possibilities, right? And so I think there's a greater possibility. There's a greater possibility of us being reconciled to to Pentecostals and, and evangelicals yeah. than us being re- reconciled to to uh, like Calvinists and stuff like that. that. There's such a huge difference in understanding of justification in those areas there, and free will and irresistible grace, and oh, uh, it just yeah. gets complicated. And like what? Like what do you mean? Yeah. What are you saying so. Like, like God loves you, and you can't hide from it. <laughs> it's like okay. you're gonna accept it, you know. Yeah, and the whole yeah, idea, it's, the whole idea of predestination too, is a bit yeah. kind of unnerving. Yeah, it's it 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 is all kind of kind of strange stuff. Um, and, and that also kind of makes me think too that I I would say there are probably. Especially by today's day and age, there's probably very few. Pr- like true Protestants left. I think there's a lot of non-Catholic Christians out there because everything's yeah. kind of gone a little willy-nilly. And then there's this small subset of like purist Protestants who are like anti-Catholic, you know? Um, right. Yeah. I don't know. That's really interesting. So then, so what's the big takeaway then? Let's like wrap this back up in a nice little pretty bow for us for catholic so, theology okay, when on it comes when it comes to justification okay for us justification means that in Jesus Christ through my baptism into Jesus Christ into the death of Jesus Christ as Paul would say that we're baptized in his death and that in his death I die to sin so that I can rise with Christ that means that in my baptism I am justified, whether I'm a baby or whether I'm an adult, I am justified in that baptism. Once I am justified, I am made God's child, God's son or God's daughter. And the Holy Spirit accompanies me and dwells in me, and it's up to me then. As a child, I need to be catechized. As an adult, I need to also be catechized in terms of how do I respond to this gift? How do I live this? How do I... incarnate this gift, right? So one, there is a remission of sin. My sin is obliterated. It's not there anymore. It's erased. It's it's gone, the remission of sin. Two, the reality is that I am made God's child. Three, is that it is necessary for me to freely accept and cooperate with this grace because God respects the free gift, the sovereign gift of free will that he has given me. So justification then for us as Catholics, again, is when somebody asks you, are you saved? You say, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I hope to be saved. That's the answer that a Catholic gives. Boom, mic drop. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Well, thanks for taking the time to help me puzzle all this out. You're welcome. You're very welcome. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. And everybody's listening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you and God bless. God bless. God bless.